Hi, and welcome to our Rural InReach broadcast for today. Today we're going to talk about nutrition and healthy eating. My name's Sarah, and I'm a project officer with the Rural InReach program, and I'm here today with Janet. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm a registered nurse midwife, and I work in the clinic at Women's Health and also in the Rural InReach program as a health consultant. So today we're going to start just with a very brief recap of what Women's Health and Family Services can offer you um, as rural clients. The medical and clinical service is staffed by doctors and nurses who've specialised in women's reproductive and sexual health. There is a dedicated counselling program as well, which in looks at all facets of counselling, including um, normal sessions to postnatal and antenatal care, a domestic violence program, our drug and alcohol service, which looks after families, so women and their families um, who are suffering or are in some form of contact with someone else who may be using. A community development team who um, look after um, communities and do a lot of outreach, Aboriginal grandparents program, and of course the rural inreach program as well. Okay, so today we're talk gonna talk about what influences our food choices. So generally speaking, most Australians have access to a wide variety of affordable and nutritious foods, and a lot of the time it comes down to choice. So we need to have more things like fresh fruit and vegetables, um, proteins, eggs, milk, dairy. We need to drink more water rather than soft drinks and fruit juices, and we need to make sure that we have um, plenty of fish in our diet as well. Generally speaking, the things that we need less of are cakes, muffins, sugars, um, beer and alcohol, and things like chips and burgers as well. Even though they taste yummy. Yeah, they do, yes. Yeah, we know <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, in the rural areas, we do appreciate sometimes um, the weather can influence your supply of fruit and vegetables um, to your communities. And in that case, um, it makes those choices a little bit more difficult. We also know, though, that the food up in the country areas costs at least 30% more than what we're paying here in the city. So we do appreciate that even though you may have the choices there, sometimes it is really an economic factor that people will actually choose foods that are um, perhaps a bit more processed than the fresh options. So we do understand that. Um, but in the instances where the roads are cut, for example, due to flooding or um, different issues that happen, then um, try and look for your more, your more healthy options, perhaps in your freezer department with frozen fruits and vegetables. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Thank you, Janet. Today we're gonna to talk about the four big ones, and that is refined and hidden sugars, salt, processed food and high GI foods, and good fats versus bad fats. Okay, so there are lots of things around these four particular um, areas of nutrition. Today, Sarah and I have decided rather than recapping on what's really good for you, um, which I'm sure you all know anyway, we're going to focus more today on the things that perhaps are not quite so obvious when you go to the supermarket or you're, you're, you're planning your menu for the week, whatever you're going to be having to eat. So um, what I wanted to tell you a little bit about is that um, Australia at the moment is ranking six in the world for obesity levels, which is pretty um, scary. Um, at the moment, around 14 million Australians are considered to be overweight or obese. Um, by the year 2025, if we continue the way we're going with our dietary choices, we are going to have 80% of adults in Australia who will be considered overweight or obese and a third of our children will also be in that um, bracket. In Australia also, we are fourth in the world with our incidence of type 2 diabetes. This is alarming. Um, of that um, rating, twice as many of our Indigenous people will succumb to type 2 diabetes. So this is a huge issue for our governments to be looking at and also us as consumers 
to really focus on our choices around our foods. Yeah, so the point around that is that yeah, these, these four things that we've got on the screen at the moment, uh, they are what contribute most to um, this health epidemic, I, epidemic, I suppose you could call it. And it contributes to things like obesity, but also cardiovascular disease, cancer, heart disease, and a lot of the really chronic illnesses that we're seeing um, in today's society at the moment. So I'm gonna move on to talk about refined sugar um, and added sugar. It's considered to be one of the most harmful foods consumed today. And that's when it's consumed in large quantities, but it's really easy to con consume sugar in large quantities because it's in so much of the products um, that we buy. It contains no fiber, no minerals, no proteins, no fats, no enzymes, and it's just empty calories. There's no nutritious content to sugar. And it also makes our blood very thick and sticky. And what are some of the problems that this can cause? Janet? Well, it could be a contributing factor towards some deep vein thrombosis, for example. Certainly, um, it would increase our chances of um, raised cholesterol levels and also um, high blood pressure. And when we have too much sugar, our body has to use um, existing vitamins and minerals to process it. So the sugar can't be processed naturally, so it has to use things like magnesium and calcium to break down the sugar. So if we have lots and lots of sugar, it can mean that we become deficient in a lot of vitamins and minerals. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that could also be contributing to um, our growing rates of osteoporosis mm, as definitely. well in our society today. We're going to move on and talk about hidden sugars. So some of the sweet tasting foods don't necessarily have sugar in the ingredient label. It could be hidden in some other way. Could be um, dextrose or modified starch. Or glucose or um, glycogen or fructose or sucrose. So anything almost with an O's on the end um, is considered to be a sugar. Yeah, and sometimes it's not, it's not that obvious, you know, you, it's not something that you really recognise, so it's really good to be aware of mm. the different things that it can be called. So 15 grams per 100 grams is considered a high sugar content, and 5 grams per 100 grams is considered a low sugar content. So when the, you check the back of um, the label on the, on the packet, which you should try to get into the habit of doing, it's really important to check the per 100 grams rather than the serving size because that can be a more accurate description of um, what's in the food that you're eating. Mm. So some examples that we've found, um, certainly breakfast cereals, uh, the breakfast drinks, which seem like a really good option if you're in a rush in the morning, um, full of sugar unfortunately. Muesli bars, we actually went and scoured the supermarket recently and found that there are some that are a lot less um, sugar loaded than others. So really it is just a matter of getting into that habit of checking the backs of the labels. Um, if you're in the habit also of putting like a muesli bar into your kids' um, lunch boxes, um, try and look for the ones that have the less amount of sugar in them. Um, Nutella, even though it's delicious, and jams are really high in sugar. Pasta sauces, um, they taste really nice and that's what we're finding. Anything that tastes really good usually has quite a lot of sugar and also a lot of times a lot of salt. Um, so any other sauces, the pre-prepared pasta sauces for example, certainly um, have sugar. Fruit juices is an obvious one. Um, it's actually not okay to um, have a glass of 100% orange juice in the morning um, instead of a freshly cut orange. How much um, sugar is there in a, a glass of 100% orange juice? Yeah, between 20 to 30 grams of sugar. Mm. Um, so it's, it's a lot. It's the same as a, a can of Coke, actually, which is um, you wouldn't usually expect. If you get the really high quality fruit juices, um, it's not as bad, but the really high quality fruit juices can be quite expensive. You are just better off cutting up an orange um, if you can. And cordials as well. Um, there's not many cordials on the market that are lower in sugar. Um, if you find that children don't like drinking plain water, the best thing to do is to add a tiny little bit of um, fresher fruit juice and then top it up with water rather than using a cordial based mm. product. Yeah, that's right. Because the issue of course with having too much sugar or hidden sugar in our diet is the um, 
is the problem with tooth decay, um, apart from all the other issues, health issues. Um, yogurt is, uh, you know, if, you, if you're happy to have unsweetened yogurt, then that's obviously the best choice. But if you do need to have a bit of sweetener in your yogurts, then do have a really close look at the labels and the sugar content mm. because there are some that are really loaded with sugar. So yeah, I really love um, yogurt. So I recently went on a bit of a mission to find a yogurt that's a little bit healthier because I do like there to be a little bit of sugar in my yogurt. I don't like unsweetened yogurt. There is some out there um, that are lower in sugar and, that, and do taste nice, but there are others out there that have between 20 to 30 grams of sugar in a little pot. Um, so that's the same amount as a Mars bar or again, a can of Coke. So you think that you're having something healthy, but actually you're having something loaded with sugar. So again, yogurt's a great, it's a healthy snack, but it's just about checking the labels. Just double check mm. what you're actually eating. Mm. A way around that could be to have the unsweetened yogurt and add um, some berries to it, mm. for example, or a banana, um, yeah, or definitely. yeah, so something that's it, it's still it, it's healthy, and you're still getting a little bit of sugar in there, but it's maybe a bit of a better choice. We're going to talk about salt. Put this diagram up there today. Um, I thought it was a really interesting diagram I came across, and what it says is that 75% of the salt in our diet comes from commercially bought or processed foods, so it's not the salt that we put um, on the table when we sit down. It's salt that's already in there. What's really worrying about this is that if you're having a lot of processed food and then you're sitting down at the table and you're also adding salt to your food, you're getting a, a meal that's incredibly, incredibly high in, in sodium or salt. Mm. I don't know if any of you are actually um, following the, the cooking shows on the TV at the moment. Um, I really like them, so I, I watch them all the time. But what I've noticed is that um, they add salt right at the end when they're presenting the food for judging. And the reason for that is that salt makes everything taste better. Um, so in a way they're cheating. They should <laughs> just be able to present their food and, um, and you know, have it accepted as it is. But they all add the salt and in fact the judges ask for it. They want that seasoning. So um, yeah, that's just a little bit extra yeah, around that. Yeah, definitely it tastes good and that's why people like it. It's, um interacts with the taste buds on our tongue. Mm. Mm. So too much salt, unfortunately, um, more than four to five grams per day can damage health. It upsets your stomach, it increases calcium loss in the kidneys, and it increases the risk of high blood pressure. It can also increase um, water retention and swelling. So the more salt you have, the more you retain water and it can make you feel quite um, puffy. It can make you feel um, overweight and bloated. So that it makes sense then that if we um, go on a diet and we reduce our salt intake, for example, then we will actually automatically drop some of that fluid that our bodies do tend to hold on to with a, a, a higher salt intake. Um, so we think we're doing really well with the diet, but in reality all we've lost is the fluid that the body was holding on to because of the salt content. Good point. So as Jan's already mentioned, um, Salt sharpens the taste buds and it increases our appetite, so it makes things taste really good and it also makes us want more of them, which is why when you open a packet of chips, you want to finish the whole packet, and why when you have a McDonald's meal, you want another one. Um, so it makes us want to eat more and more. Mm. Which then, of course, leads to becoming overweight. Mm. Mm. Yep. So some of the foods that are high in salt are things like stock cubes and soy sauce, other sauces and salad dressings, but you can look for low sodium, op sodium options of these. They are available in the supermarket. Mm, that's a good point. Certainly all of those um, come in, in, and also low, um, so they, you know, low salt, low sugar, low fat versions. Yeah. Um, cured and processed meats. Yeah, these consist of um, your, you know, your hams, your prosciutto. The pastrami, yeah. so anything really that you can mm. buy. Even from silver your side, daily counter, yep, yeah. the silver sides. Um, even buying um, the brisket. So sometimes in winter I like to have um, um, a, corn, a corn beef, for example. Um, really delicious, makes yummy cold meat for sandwiches the next day, but really high in salt. Um, so what I tend to do now, rather than doing that, is to buy a chicken on the weekend, um, cook it, have it as one meal, like a roast dinner, and then have it for cold meats um, for salads and sandwiches during the week. Yeah, it's a good idea. 
Um, snack food, so obviously your nuts, um, salt, salty peanuts, who, who doesn't like salty peanuts? Uh, um, your chips, your pretzels, um, all those sorts of options, corn chips for example, um, your canned and um, jarred food, so your pasta sauces, your canned soups, um, vegetarian meal replacements, unfortunately if you're wanting to do the right thing and have a vegetarian diet and you're eating those um, the vegetarian meal replacement products, they're really high in salt. And diet frozen meals um, stands to reason they're pre-prepared, they're pre-cooked, they're frozen, so to make them taste really good, they add a lot of salt to them. Yeah, and just around that, um, just to make a point around, um, food corporations are very, very good at marketing their foods and they've been doing it for a long time now. So. Um, we can often get tricked by the marketing, it's so clever. Um, so it's just important to, to look at the back. The labels have to be honest. Um, so to get into that habit of checking labels and just be aware that what you see on the television or what you might see on the front of the box isn't necessarily um, what you're getting. The problem with the, the diet frozen meals and what's quite frightening is that the amount of salt that's in them is gonna make you more hungry. So the more you eat of them, the hungrier you get. Um, so you do wonder a little bit about the dye industry's in intention around this. Um, yeah, it's quite, just be, yeah, be aware of very clever marketing. Mm, that's a good point. Moving on to processed foods and <laughs> foods that are high in GI. So highly processed foods um, are generally speaking, have a high GI level and unprocessed foods or natural foods have low GI. So when I say GI, I'm talking about glycemic index and that's how much um, sugar is in foods but that can be in the form of carbohydrate not just sugar so a lot of carbohydrates when they enter the body they turn into sugar um, and that can mean that a food is very high in GI. Foods containing um, 70 or above GI index are considered high 55 and below is considered low GI. Mm. So some examples of high um, GI rating foods obviously are your white breads, your white pastas, your mm. white flours, your sugars, those sorts of foods. And low GI examples are more your, um, your vegetables, um, sweet potato for example, pumpkins, um, carrots are mid, mid moderate sort of range. But generally the more, as Sarah said, the more uh, unprocessed foods I definitely have a low a lower GI rating and what that does is it makes you feel full for longer mm. um, if you have something that's got a high GI rating and you eat it um, you're going to feel unsatisfied very quickly and you will be looking for something else so it makes sense to load your diet up with foods that are a lower GI index yeah so we've got a big list of processed foods here and um, lots on this list yeah so obviously looking at your baked goods, things that you use for cooking, um, particularly if you're using your white flours and your white sugars, um, then moving on with processed fruits, so canned fruits that have the sugar syrups added to them. You can buy them without the sugar syrup um, and they're obviously a lot better for you if you're going to be using those. Um, processed vegetables, so canned vegetables often have quite a lot of salt in them. Um, our convenience foods that we buy, whether we buy them over the counter from um, um, outlets or whether we buy them frozen. So moving on to processed meats, so canned meats and cured meats, um, so things that are not in their original um, form. So if you go to the supermarket and buy um, a steak or a chicken breast or um, some nice quality mince, um, that's fine, that's not a processed meat group, but when they become things like sausages or bacon or luncheon meat, and that's when they've started to become um, a processed food. Um, processed dairy products, so things like cheese and cheese related products, processed fats and oils, so margarine, salad dressings, tomato sauces, and with these ones there can be um, ones that are certainly better than others. And drinks, so soft drinks and fruit drinks and the um, instant breakfast drinks as well. And then obviously our sugars that we, we take in. So there are lots of things in there that um, are a little bit obscure, like corn syrup, for example, rice syrup, honey um, that's processed, um, syrups, puddings, so the puddings you can buy from the supermarket shelves, um, dessert mixes, ice cream, unfortunately, um, frozen desserts, lollies are an obvious one, um, creams, chocolates, 
marshmallows, etc., and sugar substitutes. So um, it doesn't mean that we can't have these. It just means that we really need to look at how often and how much we're having of them. Yeah, so they just need to be um, little, you know, um, a small amount, and then, you know, your main food needs to be complex mm -hmm. carbohydrates and your fruits and your vegetables and your, your protein as well. So you can definitely still have these things, um, yeah. just, um, just a small amount. Okay, so we're going to look at good fats versus bad fats. So we need to limit our unhealthy fats and their saturated and trans fat, and we need to eat more of healthy fats, so mono and polyunsaturated. Fats. So unhealthy fats are things like croissants, chips, white breads, um, chocolate cakes, ice cream, and our healthy fats are things like eggs, avocado, um, and nuts. If we do need fat. Um, it's okay to have some fat. It's just making a choice about which fat to have and how much. Um, so what healthy fats give us are um, it improves our vision, so it keeps our vision um, healthy our brain function, certainly help for our joints and also our heart. So we do need to have some fats in our diet, definitely. Um, one of the things that um, is maybe not known is that to lose weight, we actually need to have healthy fat because it helps to burn down our body fat, our body weight. Yeah, that's right. It makes our cells more healthy. So the healthier our cells, the quicker our metabolism runs. So, um, yeah, healthy fat is definitely a big part of, um, you know, a good diet and um, certainly essential if you want to lose some weight. Yeah. So some things that um, are really great to put into your diet, if you can, um, cold water fish. So um, salmon, for example, is brilliant. So if you can't access fresh salmon or frozen salmon, then canned salmon is a really good alternative. Um, just be careful not to get any with the additives in, um, like you know the flavourings, for example, because they sometimes add mm. salt with those flavourings. Yeah. yeah. Um, sardines um, and herring. Sard canned sardines are one of the, the mega health foods, um, and certainly recommended for um, menopausal women, for example. If you have sardines um, a couple of times a week on toast with tomato is delicious, um, you're, you're really doing your body a, a good turn. Um, flax seeds, um, these can be ground up um, or added to foods. Uh, eggs, avocados, we've already mentioned. Nuts and beans, um, they're obviously they're the unsalted raw variety um, of nuts. And unrefined coconut, um, avocado, hemp, um, macadamia and olive oils. So there's a few in there that are a little bit different. Um, I've tried a few of them. Um, the avocado oil is delicious, but I usually will always have um, extra virgin cold pressed olive oil as um, in my kitchen that I use all the time. Unhealthy fats. Um, animal fats definitely are better to avoid. Refined oils like um, soy, corn, vegetable and safflower oils um, and also looking at um, deep fried foods, um, takeaway meals, baked goods etc because they actually contain quite a lot of trans fats which actually add to the build up of the toxic fat that sits around our tummies and ends up um, coating all our major internal organs. Yeah, that's right. And I'm sure we've all seen the ads recently with the pictures of the toxic fat around our organs. It's quite disgusting. It is. Um, but yeah, they're very confronting adverts, that's for sure. It's very scary. Mm. So just going to review what we just talked about. Um, so we talked about refined and hidden sugars. Um, so refined sugars are sugars that are not naturally occurring in, in food. Um, it can often be the white sugar. Um, and that's really bad for us. And hidden sugars are foods that you may not think contain sugar, but actually they contain quite a lot. So just being aware of that. We also talked about salt. So being aware that most of the salt that we eat has already been added to the food before it gets to our dinner plate. Um, and then if you further add salt to that food, you're getting a meal that's incredibly high in sodium. Yeah. And moving on to processed foods, with a, particularly with a high glycemic index. Okay, so really looking at trying to make choices between something off the shelf rather than in the vegetable and fruit bins um, in your shopping centre. 
and good fats and bad fats. So really making those choices around what you're cooking with, what you're adding to your foods, um, trying to make the choices um, right from the very beginning rather than um, you know, realising too late that you've got quite a lot of trans fat going on in that particular meal. So we're going to look at child and teenage nutrition now? Really important to give kids a great start in life um, as best you can. So if you're a mum who can actually um, breastfeed your, your, your baby or your children, then that would be something that we would encourage and support. Children and adolescents do need um, nutritious food to grow and develop normally. It helps with their cell development, their bone development, um, their everything that they need to, to be well and to grow into healthy people. So basically what we would look at offering them is plenty of um, fresh vegetables, lentils, pulses and fruits, lots of cereals, so breads, rice, pasta, noodles. However, looking at your whole grain and whole meal options for the noodles and pastas and rices and breads, um, kids need those particular um, things because they're heavily loaded with carbohydrates. And as we know, they're on the go. Um, they're heavily involved in play and sport usually. And um, so that's why that sort of food is really important because they need that to be converted to the energy to keep them going and get them through the day. On the other hand, if you have kids who are quite sedentary, so there's been quite a lot of time playing Xbox or you know watching DVDs, um, and they're still eating a diet that's heavily loaded with their cereals, um, so their breads, their rices and pastas and noodles, particularly two minute mm. noodles, which are really particularly bad, yeah. really high in salt and fat, um, they're the kids who are going to end up um, putting on weight, okay, and becoming overweight and potentially falling into that that bracket of um, overweight or obese kids. Yeah, that's right. And it's definitely a huge issue at the moment, child childhood obesity. Um, and it's, they think that it's caused by this um, huge increase in this sedentary lifestyle in sitting at home watching TV and playing on the Xbox, playing on the computer games, but still having a diet that's hugely high in um, carbohydrate and, sh and sugar. Yeah. Okay, so looking at um, putting lean meat, fish, um, chicken, um, or alternatives in there for their protein component, but not overloading them with that. They don't need a huge amount. None of us really need a lot of protein in our diet, but we do need some. It is considered healthy to have a bit of protein. Um, also milks, yogurts, cheese and alternatives. So looking at um, the dairy as well. Reduced fat products are not suitable for kids under two years of age. They need the fat. They need that for their brain development in particular. Um, so above two though, um, it is considered safe to give them um, reduced fat alternatives if, if you um, have that available. Um, certainly looking at water, um, trying to encourage your kids to drink water all day, every day. In our climate, we really need to drink water because it's, um, we're hot a lot of the time for the year. Um, and so we lose a lot of our body, body fluid and nutrients. So it's really good to keep that um, fluid level up. Um, limit the saturated fats and certainly the amount of fats that we have in our diet every day for, for kids. Looking at low salt um, choices, so as I mentioned, two minute noodles, a really quick afternoon tea snack when they get home from school, for example, actually not a great idea. It would be better to use um, an alternative noodle that could be cooked up and then add some, you know, some chopped up fresh veggies or something to that, which could fill the bill in that instance if they're feeling really hungry. Or, you know, um, a wheat bix with um, a spread on, for example, is, is that what we used to have as kids? Consume only small amounts of sugars and foods containing added sugar. Well, you know, it's the same for kids as it is for adults. Too much sugar is actually not okay. And leading on from there. Yeah, so we'll talk about additives and preservatives and a lovely picture of all these lollies. Um, so there's been a lot of publicity about this recently, about additives and preservatives, particularly in children's food. 
So what it means is that the, when you look at the ingredients on the packet, you'll see um, colours and you'll see numbers which can be preservatives or additives. There's been a lot of studies recently that have linked um, these food additives and these food colours to child's um, behaviour. Um, so things like ADHD, um, there's been quite a few studies that have linked the two together. So just being aware that, and parents already know it already because they talk about it, you know, kids have sugar and iron, they don't go to bed or um, they'll go to a kid's birthday party and they'll run around all day screaming. Um, so it's definitely, the awareness is already out there, but just to, to limit these foods, because um, being aware that they not only affect your child's health, but they'll affect their behaviour as well. Okay, so we're going to finish up today. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the dietitian that we have at Women's Health and Family Services. Um, she's really fantastic. She gives some great information and advice and she can be accessed through our program via video conference or via the phone. Um, so you can contact us by phoning 6330-5400 or 1800-998-399. You can go to our website or you can email us at ruralinreach at whfs.org.au and I'd just like to point out that that dietitian service is free of charge. So thank you for um, listening to us today. Um, please feel free to contact us at the Rural InReach program or Women's Health and Family Services Monday to Friday and we'll assist you in any way that we can. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>